So my name is Sarah Betcher, and um, we have uh, Akchak Schaefer. We're going to be doing a presentation today um, all about climate change in Kotzebue, Alaska. Um, so I'm going to be sharing with you the perspective as an ethnographer. Um, I've been spending six years going to Kotzebue frequently and across northwest Alaska. Um, as an ethnographic filmmaker. So I've been interviewing um, elders for several years. Um, Akachak and I met each other at a ethnobotany class in Kotzebue several years ago. And um, after a couple videos that I made this last week that highlight the indigenous perspective of climate change, Akachak will be giving her perspective of climate change in that area having been from Kotzebue. So um, I'm going to be showing uh, two videos. One of them is a short video, and it introduces a project that um, I've been involved with for three years now called Ikogvik Sikakun, which is Inupiaq for ice bridges. And it's a project that uh, researches how sea ice is changing and measuring the depths and using unmanned aerial vehicles to look at the ice using different payloads and also um, indigenous knowledge. So we have a team of about 15 people. I don't want to tell you too much about it because I've made a narrated video all about that. So the first video uh, just has music, but it kind of shows you some footage of all the different ways we've been researching the sea ice in Kotzebue Sound. So I'll go ahead and um, cue that up. And this is about a two and a half minute video. Uh, so I got brought on by the project um, as a recommendation because of my um, local connections that I had developed over the years uh, as an ethnographic filmmaker. So kind of how I got started in that region was to make uh, first um, 
a regional training film for NOAA personnel so that the weather service had a better idea of how weather and climate impact people who are subsisting on the land. So how does uh, changing wind direction affect hunters who are reliant on how wind affects the tides, as it very much does in Cosview Sound? And how does uh, warming temperatures affect people who are reliant on catching fish, um, hunting seals, hunting birds, those sorts of things? Um, rural Alaska has very expensive food and it's important that local people have access to healthy wild food from the land. So um, I've been able to continue to do film work. So this is um, a few projects in for me and it's still another year, but our field work has completed. So I'm going to go ahead and queue up the next video and it is um, a compilation of four of our elders on our team who are indigenous from the area who are giving their perspective and I've narrated the video which is the very first video I've made that I've narrated uh, so instead of doing a PowerPoint I went ahead and uh, made a video out of it so hopefully you enjoy it and this is about a 30 minute video I know you crack the Navan Eternate Ma, Mani Orami Ma, Kangani, Akapira Lichunga, Kamanga Sixenyat Miunga, Akalevika, um, a little old man I am becoming. On top, these Maniks on the tundra, the grass grows in clumps like a little seat. So we call them Manik. Mani Orami Ma, Kangani, on top, Akapira Lichunga, I must sit down. My back is becoming bent over. It smells, but you can't help it when you're growing older. Lament. I've been asked by many elders to help get their story out to the world, commenting that they live in the middle of nowhere and they feel there's no way to get their voice out to the public about how their environment is changing very rapidly. I am honored to have the trust of elders, especially in Northwest Alaska, to video record their stories and to share these stories with the world. Many of these stories express the importance of securing a subsistence way of life which includes access to foods gathered and hunted from the wild country. This is a design that all Eskimos had. There are concerns related to this due to the rapid changes in the environment. Such as prevailing wind direction changes, temperature increases, shortened winters, ocean acidification, permafrost melt, erosion, species die-offs, this list is long, and the change has been so rapid, no one seems to know exactly how to best adapt and stay safe in such a changing world. This video showcases interviews with indigenous members of Cotsview, including the Ikagvik Sikakun Indigenous Expert Advisory Council that I've been interviewing since the start of our project in November of 2016. It does, so the fog came in this way and it went right into town. Many elders have expressed to me what kind of climate and other environmental conditions are important to maintain the integrity of foods gathered from the land. Healthy, cool, and predictable ocean conditions have been creating challenges for today's Inupiaq people. Oh. 
I'd like to showcase knowledge shared by Vernetta Moberly. She's been a close friend of mine for over six years and has opened my mind to the ways of the upriver, where she is originally from, and from the coastal Anupiaq people of Northwest Alaska, where she now resides. A true young elder, as many people describe her as. Many times we would throw the guts of the she fish to the noyaks. By morning, the cleanup crew clean it up. They eat everything. This is a good time to cut your fish, to hang it, make your half-dried cock. The sea ice is used extensively for subsistence travel, hunting, and processing foods. Now it's just good to clean your fish right out here because the water itself is melted snow. It's just wonderful and clean, pristine water. Just clean it, clean it as best as you could, rubbing off the blood. When I go home, I will wash them again in a bucket of uh, vinegar water. So when it's rainy, people will just try and um, clean them like this, drain them nice, and put, put them straight into the freezers so the fish won't spoil. And she fish is real easy to spoil. But uh, even though we catch, catch them last night and put them away overnight, it's cold enough that they, they weren't softening up. They were beautiful and real nice to work with. Keep our planet nice and clean and pristine. We need our kids, young children today, to enjoy what we enjoy all our lives, clean water, clean river, clean ocean. The earth needs these parts of the planet to stay clean. And it's us people to do that, that job, to help her. Because the rest of the world is so damaged. And so the rivers of life is what will keep the rest of the world to go back in, into mending. The lungs, the trees needs to grow. So there are many ways to think. We have young, young children nowadays that talk about saving the trees and they could, they learn a lot of ways to make sure our planet survive. I had cut this one, so that's just 100% ready. Don't need to cut this one, just wash it. On May 8th of 2018, I had the opportunity to take a snow machine trip across Kotzebue Sound's thin spring sea ice out towards Cape Lawson, which is roughly 16 miles south of Kotzebue. As terrifying as it was to traverse across such thin ice covered in meltwater, we made it to the Cape. Bobby Schaefer and John Goodwin shared the changes they've seen over their lifetime, which has been truly profound. We're at the top of uh, Cape Blossom, and uh, this is the highest point today. But all the highest points of Cape Blossom are gone in, in my lifetime. So this was a lot higher when we were kids. Massive erosion. The lighthouse fell into the ocean probably 25, 30 years ago. Uh, when we used to commercial fish out here, you used to see it all the time when it fell down. But uh, all that is gone. Uh, massive erosion throughout the Baldwin Peninsula is, is probably the same as this. So just right over here, about five miles. And it's now eroding faster than most places. So it is real. There's no doubt in my mind that the waters are rising. 
I'm still grateful we made it to the Cape that day to witness a lack of sea ice no one had ever documented. Standing at the edge of the Cape, we watched the open ocean's water lap up on the thin sea ice edges. In a way telling us that this would be the last day of 2018, we could safely traverse the sea ice. And it was. Our field season of sea ice research came to an end that day because it had to. The sea ice would start breaking any moment, too close to shore for any kind of travel. I spent over six years frequenting Kotzebue and the surrounding villages and landscapes, but still, I'm merely a visiting ethnographer recording other people's stories. Is it really okay for me to share stories that are not mine? John Goodwin is an elder who has expressed to me and other visiting researchers how he feels his knowledge isn't validated and hopes that someone like me would publish his traditional knowledge saying, people learn a lot about white man's ways through TV. But if you start putting some native stuff in there, they ain't gonna forget. He also said, I sure hope you guys put something out there because I'm sure it will grab the world's attention. And we work with different agencies. Pretty much every time we try to acknowledge our uh, tradition knowledge, tradition knowledge, what they claim is invalid, basically because uh, there's no documentation of what we know. So that's where a lot of our uh, ideas and what we know when we tell them that they couldn't accept that. But as years went by, like this project, uh, I can see it's going to be real beneficial basically to, uh, to the future, in the future, because we're validating what our, our people knew with this kind of project. As long as I'm capable and able to help, I'd like to, because, you know, I, it hurts a person like me to try to tell, you know, other people, and they're not understanding or not, not listening uh, about our knowledge, what do we know. Bobby Schaefer, lifelong Kotzebue resident, fisherman, and plays a role as a boat taxi captain. He has expressed his concerns about climate change to me for years. His concerns include the end times and doomsday. He takes Western scientists out on his boat throughout the year, interacting with people who are in the center of climate change research. The exchange of information gives Bobby an edge to current climate change state of affairs. He is also out in the wilderness, experiencing changes firsthand, and getting his knowledge confirmed by Western science data shared to him by many. Bobby has been a great guide for the Akagvik Sikakun team, and also sharing his firsthand, lifelong experience of how the Northwest Arctic is rapidly changing. On May 7, 2018, we were doing sea ice research several miles out on the sea ice from Kotzebue. Bobby shared with me what he witnessed over this last winter. When we got involved in the sea ice study, we were pretty excited at one point in time last last summer or last year, and and uh, we thought we'd have a normal winter, but it didn't happen. So it created some challenges for us to try to do a lot this year because uh, the sea ice didn't get thick enough, so a lot of us that uh, go out on it and go seal hunting. Uh, didn't do that this year because it was just too unsafe. More so this year than last. So uh, the last couple of years has been really challenging. Um, so when it was, this whole thing was put together, uh, we were excited about the drones uh, and, and their, and their uh, participation in the study with the cameras and other things that they have on it. Uh, we were also excited about getting out and doing some actual hands-on work out in the ocean. Um, we were limited there because we couldn't get out there. It was just, it was just too unsafe. A lot of wind. Uh, the first day we went over to Sadie Creek and wanted to go out a little bit. And uh, we went out 50 yards and there were fresh cracks already. Ice was safe. The ice was about three foot, but it was just 
it's one of those things when you have fresh cracks, you just don't go out there. You just uh, that, otherwise you, had, you know you have you put your life in danger. So that was one of the things that sort of um, uh, made us real cautious when we started traversing in the other places in the uh, in the ocean. We were able to get out to the uh, islands. Uh, to the sandbars out there because we just follow, I, I just followed the sandbars and we tested all the way just to make sure that we can get out there safely. And we did that twice and that was stretching it, you know, um, because uh, there was high winds and a lot of waves out there and since the ocean was, the Kotzebue Sound was ice free, you know, you have 40 mile an hour winds, you have 20 foot waves and they were beating against the edge of the ice and just, just a huge chunks of ice were leaving. And uh, so we couldn't uh, go out there as far as we wanted, uh, and, and stay there longer to do more, to do more, more, stu more tests and studies. So uh, that, that put a crimp in our effort. On April 2nd, 2019, a few members of the Akagvik Sikakum project headed out to the sea ice edge northwest of Cotsview. The ice edge ends up being a great place for Bobby to share examples of the changes in the landscape and wildlife seen over he and his father's lifetime. Like my dad said, I just couldn't believe in the last 25 or 30 years, I'd never seen storms that strong in his lifetime. He was on this earth for 91 years, you know, mm -hmm. seeing bugs that he's never seen before, seeing birds that he's never seen before. He talked about thawing out the permafrost and how it's so evident that it's happening, you know, and huge changes, you know. Look at this. I just saw 20 seals go by just in the last half hour, 45 minutes. What's happening is that the concentrations of seals are, are going to where there is ice. There isn't too many places there is ice. This is an example of, of what's happening. Is they're concentrating because they have to have ice. <laughs> seals as a staple food in this part of the world are at the center of concern for local people. We used to come out here this time of the year because we knew the ice was going to be five foot thick, you know. And it's been like that for probably thousands of years. But now it does, ice doesn't get thick anymore. And we, normally, in March and April, this is frozen solid all the way to the outside lead, where the lead normally is on past ceiling point, which is about probably another 20 mile out here. But now, it's just, this is unheard of. And we've, this is the third year in a row it's been like this. Things are changing real fast. We had record temperatures in February, you know, and normally that's your 30, 40 below month. And uh, temperatures in February were above 20 degrees, all February. Indigenous people sharing their concerns and sharing their knowledge within the research teams helps focus research on the locations that are the most important for subsistence hunting. Cyrus Harris grew up at camp, which means he grew up surrounded by the traditions of his people relating to gathering, hunting, fishing, and knowing the seasons intimately so as to know when best to gather certain species. But over here is where I would see it just crumble and work its way up, slowly work its way up until we finally get open water along this channel here. Intimately connected to the water and the land around Kotzebue Sound, he is seen and respected as a leader and elder. He is a leader in keeping Anupak foods on elders' tables by running a traditional foods program through the Manilik Association to cover the costs of hunters getting wild game for elders. He also teaches youth how to process local wild Just, food. Okay, this came from the Cotsby Sound. We've separated the carcass on, at the first class. So that's the first step. The next step is to be cleaning the meat portions off the blubber before it gets uh, separated from the skin. A lot of them is first time hands-on experience for them. So it kind of gives them an idea on you know, wh where they get their seal oil from that they consume at home. Cyrus has been a huge asset to the Akagvik Sikakun team. He not only helps with data gathering, guiding the team safely across the sea ice, answering questions, but also provides a wealth of invaluable knowledge about the weather, sea ice, seal habitat. So this would be the test if it was a male seal that's using this hole. And general observations about changes in the climate over his lifetime. 
And it's been a very unusual weather pattern that we've been having this winter. We had more storms than usual, snowstorms. We have more snow than we had for quite a number of years. So we're going to be seeing a lot of uh, overflow during the spring thaw, um, a lot of water runoff and possible low-lying areas of you know, some certain flooding. But um, yet the time has come. It's, we're, we're still in the month of April. And right in the experience that we're having right now with, uh, with the weather that we've had before, it was probably about mid-May. On April 30th, 2018, I rode with Cyrus on his snow machine along with team members following from behind. Cyrus spotted some seals and was able to share information about this staple subsistence food. Seal habitat and distribution is also at the center of our research priorities. We're back out here in front of Sisolik, roughly about a mile off the beach on the channel that heads out to the Kotzebue Sound. And here we have a, appears to be a denning area with a little roofing site on there where the pup is uh, being protected while the mother is out here. So she's leaving a little blood behind, so which I'm guessing is from birthing. So. What I love about documenting knowledge through film is that I'm able to find ways to record knowledge within the context in which someone is speaking about, allowing the viewers to gain a deeper understanding. We're out here in front of Nubukuruk, roughly about 12 miles away from Kotzebue on the Kotzebue Sound, near Sisolik, and out here, uh, not very far out here, I'm guessing about four, maybe five miles out here is open water, open water that we had all winter due to the prevailing east-southeast winds and the lack of uh, landfast ice that can hold it in. Up on the horizon here, you can see some ice piles what we call Ivernix, but the blue skies out here is what we normally would look for when we're looking for open water, as you can see these dark blue skies. On uh, this direction toward my right, it uh, connects over toward Ceiling Point, which is another ideal place to where we would venture off to the ice to go and look for, uh, to go and look for leads to hunt out of. But in this case, this year, we can't even leave the beach over at Ceiling Point because it's open all the way to the beach. Um, so this is what we're kind of looking for. Something like after a storm in February, after a good cold spell, then we would have, they'd be a good winter storm and then a warming weather such as what we have today. And then suddenly a big blue sky that we'd be looking for, for a lead to be hunting off. That would be an ideal time to be out on the lead. But of course, this past several years, we couldn't go out there because we didn't have we didn't have stable landfast ice uh, soon enough throughout the winter. The ice that we're standing on just kind of formed here. I believe this one formed in uh, this January, this past January, what we're sitting on. It should have been frozen in October uh, on a normal given year. It seems important for elders to keep sharing with the youth and others how to read the weather, how to read the ice texture and color, to detect if it's safe to travel. These are just information that was shared down, you know, with us when we were growing up. Uh, someone to watch the boat, someone to be with the boat at all times, because anything can happen out there. Um, anything, yeah, and it's, it's different. It, uh, going from one location to the next, there could be a long open water to get to and from, and those open waters are are the most fierce once the winds pick up, pick up and so, it's one thing we have to try to be aware of. The clouds always indicate open water because the vapor is coming up. So every time you see a black cloud in the ocean, you know where the water is. A couple of days ago, half of this was black and the other half was white. So I knew there was a fog coming. Okay. And then on this side was all black, so the fog didn't hit that side. So the fog came in this way and it went right into town. It's too open, way out, way too open. It's just uh, way ahead of schedule. When when we were kids, when we um, hunted Ugruk, we hunted Ugruk in June 15th, after June 15th. Now um, the earliest, I mean, I just got Ugruk last week, and I got, a friend of mine got two of them two days ago. Because Ugruk, um, 
they frequent the ocean. And the uh, ring seals, they frequent uh, shallow waters. And this is part of the shallow water. Yeah. We're right inside of a sandbar, which is another two miles out or a mile and a half out. I think it's easy to judge something we don't understand. I think film can help take people to places they may never go and hear stories they may otherwise not have access to hear. Ross Schaefer, a very active hunter and lifelong resident of Cotsview. We have become friends over the years and I've been able to film him seal hunting several times. I'm tremendously grateful for the trust to film such a sacred hunt. On April 4th, 2019, I'm able to film a seal hunt in which Ross is mentoring a young man to teach him the ways to successfully hunt seal from the sea ice. I'm sitting on the back of the sled, sliding across the packed snow and onto the Cosby Sound sea ice. I stay warm and comfortable because Ross has laid down a caribou hide for me to sit on. His wife, Millie, let me borrow a fur hat that covers my ears and won't freeze with my warm breath. I wear goggles to protect the sharp spears of ice that come up from the fast-moving snow machine. All the locals I have spoken with have discussed how dangerous the sea ice has been. 2018 had major lack of sea ice, much warmer weather than is considered normal, and sea ice measuring 33 to 36 inches, as opposed to 4 to 5 feet thick, which is what locals tell me was the norm until recently. This year, in 2019, our team was taking measurements reading only 12 to 15 inches. If I'm going to risk going out with anyone on today's unstable, unpredictable sea ice, I'm glad to be traveling with someone who spends a lot of time in the country. Are you going to shoot from here or huh? are you going to shoot from here? Or are we uh, went down. Yeah, it just went down. We'll, we'll go back. Uh, we'll go out.
how will people stay safe as the world changes so rapidly and people feel they can't always trust their traditional knowledge these days? I hope we continue to find ways to showcase indigenous knowledge about climate change. I feel it's important for all of our well-being. Thank you to all the Inupiaq people who have shared knowledge about their ancestral land, and I hope this will help build a bridge of understanding of how to read our natural world as it changes. Well, thank you. Um, I put that together in a week, so it's not it's not perfect yet. <laughs> uh, but um, I was just inspired to uh, kind of put that message out, and also the request of the elders. And I I called them a couple weeks ago and made sure they were okay. Me showing footage to you guys, and they were, in fact, they were um, encouraging of it, especially with the last couple of years and seeing such significant change. Um, so I'm just going to cue. Akachak's presentation. So um, Akachak is from, uh, born and raised in Kotzebue, and actually a couple of the elders up on the screen are her relatives. Uh, her father is Ross and her uncle is Bobby. And um, I think it's going to be great for us to hear also from um, a slightly different generation and someone who's from there. So this is kind of the stories of the elders and uh, a bit of my um, experience um, interacting with the elders. So I'd like to welcome up Akachak and I'll go ahead and um, cue her presentation as she comes up and uh, shares with us a slideshow. So this was my first time uh, seeing the film as well. It was really uh, great to see footage from home. Well, he said I didn't need to do that. Uvla Lotak, Uvanga Atika Akachak. Uh, hello, my name is Akachak. Kikiktawurmi. Uh, I'm Inupak from Kotzebue. My parents are Kaleok and Aviksak, Ross and Millie Schaefer. Uh, both my parents born and raised in Kotzebue. And I, I really love the footage of uh, my dad. I, I love going out hunting with my dad, uh, seal hunting caribou you name it um, beluga hunting uh, I always enjoy going out with him and just like Sarah said um, I absolutely feel completely safe going out with him because he knows how to read the land the water the ice um, Sarah had said uh, she, she was out with my dad and she was like can I walk over there he was like no <laughs> you know you have to learn uh, what's safe and what isn't uh, especially out in the ocean so for me, there are many changes in our small Inuit landscape that have uh, happened in my short uh, 44 and 3 quarter years. Um, yet within our limited time frame, I will focus on a, only a few examples. Ever since I can remember, uh, spring came slowly. Uh, the snow would gradually melt, lighter jackets would be worn, and the daylight would stay longer and longer throughout the evening. Uh, we would constantly make trips to the shore, uh, to Front Street, to see the ice flows as it made its way out into the ocean. Huge ice piles would form uh, near my grandfather's house uh, at the end of Kotzebue um, and push as ahead as the ice from upriver made its way down to Kotzebue. And springtime in the Arctic was usually marked by the ice moving and swiftly followed by Ugruk season. Ugruk is our bearded seal, our largest seal in fact, and it is what sustains us throughout the long winter months. Our Ugruk season used to be late June, sometimes early July, and as my father said, um, you know, has come as early as May and April. Instead of a slow, drawn out spring where the thick sea ice breaks up and flows out, we are seeing the thin ice simply melt and hardly any ice break up. When I was a kid growing up in Kotzebue, my family kept our nikapak, or our native food uh, of dried seal meat, uhuraks, 
or rendered blubber and seal oil stored in wooden barrels. We had about four to five barrels that stood waist high. Each spring, we would have to clean the barrels, my mother and I and whoever was helping. Uh, we had to scrub them out and remove any of the old oil um, from the year before. And once rinsed out, uh, we'd fill them full of water to help them expand uh, to prevent leaks. And this was in preparation for the spring harvest. So outside of our house, we had, and this is outside of our house in Kotzebue, um, outside of our house, we had what looked like a trench, and it was about three, four, three to four feet deep. It was dug in the permafrost, and this was right alongside our house. And this is where we stored our wooden barrels. In the middle of winter, if you wanted nikapak or native food, uh, you had to go outside in the freezing cold and with your sleeves rolled up and your naked hand, you had to reach down into the uh, wooden barrels um, and pick out, uh, from the frozen seal oil, pick out your um, black meat, your, your seal meat, and your uhuraks, um, and put it in a bowl, and then quickly wrap your hand in a paper towel and run inside. Uh, in the summer, even with our 24-hour daylight, um, the permafrost kept the barrels cold. So having uh, wooden barrels outside during my childhood, uh, this worked for about 10 or so years. When it was no longer cold enough to use a trench and the summers got a little bit warmer, my family had to make a sigalok or sod house. And this was uh, a separate little sod house constructed with tundra and wood and this is where we kept our wooden barrels for cold storage. This is not the same one. This is actually somebody else's uh, sigalok, but you can see the tundra on top um, and the insulation. So at my great grandfather's, uh, sorry, my, my grandfather's camp, uh, which was about 28 miles north of Kotzebue, my grandparents' original sod house was built within the hillside uh, near their home. And I remember going up there, uh, someone would open a, a tiny little door uh, that led to a kind of cellar. And there was a, they would reach in, pull out uh, the wooden lid, it had a little bit of insulation. There was a ladder that led down there uh, into the cellar where they had food. And it was freezing cold. And so back in Kotzebue, if you have wooden barrels that are meant to be frozen and they're not, um, then you get mold and you're, you know, you're not preserving your food anymore. So our two sod houses that we built, um, one in town and one at Sadie Creek at our camp, no longer stayed cold enough. So eventually my family had to abandon the sod house, which gradually warmed and collected with water and moisture. Uh, we also had to abandon the wooden barrels, uh, which were no longer practical. So we found our alternative um, turned out to be five gallon plastic buckets, which was the only thing available at the time. And over the years, uh, you know, we had found some smaller uh, plastic buckets and now we mostly use glass mason jars to store our food. So pictured here is my mother um, with, and, and then uh, further down is my father working on nutjik, which is a smaller seal. And you know now it's necessary to store our native food in freezers. Uh, and this is the only way to ensure our food stays cold and frozen year round. So at my parents' home in Kotzebue, uh, they have two full-size chest freezers, the, the big long ones, one smaller full-size chest freezer outside the home in a Quonset hut, one stand-up freezer in the home full of food, not including the fridge freezer full of native food. Um, so that's how we have to preserve them now. So our seals too, uh, we have noticed changes in their blubber, uh, where their blubber has what looks like disease, red in discoloration and sometimes yellow. Um, I remember the first time when we were outside at camp cutting seal um, and asking my parents what was the cause of this, and uh, we didn't know. And we're still unsure, um, but we've grown accustomed to seeing it. Uh, we typically simply cut it out. 
um, most of the time we eat the rest of the seal, not knowing what is going on with them. Um, on a few occasions, my father has found seals riddled with this sickness, um, and those we throw away and don't eat. Let's see. So with the change in permafrost melting, our hillsides and our coastlines are irreversibly impacted. When we bury our deceased, whether in the middle of winter or summer, we typically use shovels and dig out the frozen earth by hand. What is happening to our land can be seen in the tops of the headstones of our ancestors and our recently deceased. Within a few years of burial, we can see our gravestones on the hillside move from erect to almost toppled over in some cases. All along our coastlines, the land is eroding 20 to 40 feet each year in some areas. Every summer season that I return home to harvest our plants, I see this alteration in our landscape. So for those of you in Southeast, Devil's Club is to clink it as wormwood is to Inuit. And my favorite spots to harvest, to, excuse me, to harvest wormwood um, or sedic rock were about four to five miles along the coast, just past my parents' camp at Sadie Creek. In this area on the hillside, there were little dips and valleys that faced the ocean. And I would take my father's four-wheeler to gather in this area. These little pockets were perfect for the wormwood to grow tall and vibrant. Little valleys that would retain the heat from the midnight sun and the wind off the water would ensure the strength of the plants. And this is where my mother's grandmother always said, uh, Wormwood, the Sedic Rogue, grows the strongest along the coast. And this is, uh, this is where I would harvest by the garbage bag full. So the year before last, traveling down the coast with my father's four-wheeler, uh, going to harvest, I discovered that my favorite places were now literally a mudslide. Uh, trailing straight into the ocean. As the permafrost melts, if you get a little trickle of water in between uh, two frozen pieces of earth, next thing you know, uh, it slides right on down into the ocean. And all along that stretch of coastline, we see mudslides where you actually cannot pass with a four-wheeler. And just like that, my favorite wormwood places are gone. So. My uncle Bobby, uh, in the previous video, had mentioned Cape Blossom, and they were standing on top of it. Um, so that's about 12 miles uh, down from my parents' camp. And pictured here in, in the distance, um, the tall structure with the red roof is my parents' camp. And the far bluff on the right um, is Cape Blossom there. And for me, Cape Blossom, like he said, was once a huge cliff. My mother's grandmother had told my mother how further out in the ocean it used to be. It used to stand, and it was, it was huge. And then Bobby had mentioned how much in his lifetime it's, it's eroded. Um, when I was a kid growing up uh, in Kotzebue, my family kept our, oh, I'm sorry. I just messed up my... So for me, Cape Blossom uh, was a place of beauty that I've always, that's always stayed with me. And in the last 10 to 15 years of visiting uh, this area, I've seen 30 plus feet each year fall into the ocean. I've seen 25 foot chunks of earth literally disconnected to any landscape, uh, where within a day's time as the waves come in, all that land is carried out into the ocean. Uh, for me, Cape Blossom now stands as a hill and not the majestic cliff it once was. Where my parents had built a cabin along this coastline, about seven to eight miles outside of Kotzebue, um, we've seen the fall and winter storms surge ocean water higher than ever before. It has removed so much land mass along our coast where such land used to protect us. My father used to say in his grandson's lifetime, uh, they will have to move the cabin that my father built at Sadie Creek. These last two years, the ocean has reached our cabin. My father has begun collecting several jacks, uh, capable of holding several thousand tons, and will have to borrow several more. Um, he's making preparations to jack up the cabin. 
So no longer is my father saying in his grandson's lifetime. Now my father is saying, uh, we have to move the cabin this year. Thank you very much. anyone to ask any questions you might have for either of us or anything you want to make a comment to um, anything at all we have a little bit of time if anyone has any comments or questions and then we have a microphone um, if you don't mind standing up to use it so one of the things I wanted to ask um, anybody in this area I had talked about the seals the nutjak in our area uh, and the ugruk when we harvest the blubber, and we've seen this red disease-looking discoloration, red, yellow, sometimes white. Um, has anybody in this area possibly seen or heard of that in the seals in this area? I was curious to learn. Go ahead. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. If you could use the mic, that way they can record your voice. <laughs> So, um, is it on? Yeah, it should be on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, I seal hunt as well with my father, and we haven't noticed so much with the blubber as far as like discoloration, um, but I have noticed that, like, you know, in, in most years, uh, when I was a little kid, the blubber would be, you know, six, eight inches thick, sometimes 10 inches, and now it's only about two inches at most. Wow. It's really thin. Um, we have noticed that there's like the seals have a lot of like cysts on them, which we think are tapeworm cysts, and the meat itself has a lot of worms in it sometimes. Really? Wow. So it's really changing down here. Um, there's also been a lot of controversy with the mines nearby and pollution, which, as far as I know, I don't know if there's any sort of federal agency. I know NOAA used to do testing, but I was wondering if you guys have anyone up north that does any sort of. Um, like miner hard mineral testing or disease testing or anything like that? I know, so I don't know what um, organization it is, but I know that my dad and other hunters, my dad has a source that he can take samples and he can send them to somebody. And I, I haven't talked to him in a while about um, sampling, so I don't know. I think it's a Department of Fish and Game. Okay. I've seen uh, flyers up in Cotsview and Ever since I've been traveling there, there's always um, some kind of flyer up for anything of concern to send in samples. And then also with um, the Cotsview IRA, they did that SEAL study for, for a couple of years. Um, and I, that information is, some of it is at least available on that website, um, okay. the Cotsview IRA website. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing. That does remind me as well of um, seeing a difference in the thickness in the blubber and having it go down. Yeah. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind the microphone. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting to see the, the the video on the slideshow here. Um, I'm from the Yukon Territory. My community is Karkos Tagish First Nation. And we have um, a lot of similar similarities as well. But we don't have seal in our, in our community or anything. We have a lot of moose and caribou in that. And in 1980, um, we had seen changes within our fish. We had two-headed fish coming out and uh, sometimes we had two tail fish. Wow. And we had mining in our area that has been shut down for, for some time. And the health nurse, uh, the community health representative at that time, who was my stepmother, um, she was from the United States. And uh, she um, took a lot of samples to the lab and all that stuff. And we have never ever got nothing back mm -hmm. and uh, to the First Nation. But although it went to the nursing station under the confidentiality form of, you know, this is just for you to know. And she broke her oath of ethics and she told the First Nation that we need to start doing something. 
and that we need to start doing it now or last week at that time. And today, um, we are still having some areas of our fish. Um, it hasn't been lately, but there has been, I think in the last past 10 years, there was another fish that was, was a two-headed fish. Wow. And it had um, a lot of cysts inside, and, um, and we couldn't eat the inside. Like, like our elders really like the, the fish liver and that. We can't eat it anymore. So my thought and vision somehow in some way, like I hate to say this, but um, the technology that we have today, um, it's your cell phones, it's the TVs. These TVs that we have now, the flat screens, uh, there's radiation outside of it. There's no, the big TVs, when we had the big t old TVs, well that's what kept the radiation inside. Now, we have three inches of radiation outside of all these flat screens today. And, uh, and that's what's killing ourself, is that we are, with the technology that we have today, you look at the radiation that is on the outside of it, uh, look up Discovery Channel or whatever, like this is where I've seen this through David Suzuki. And it is part, of, we're killing ourself. You know, man is killing himself. Like all this new technology that we have, you look at the radiation of it, and it's along with the mining. Mining was the beginning of destruction of Mother Earth. And the pollution that comes out of mining, you know, the, what you call that, tailings, tailings. ponds. Um, and look what happened in BC when that um, big pond broke, you know, and we're having effects of it here, the Yukon, you know, and uh, we need to start looking at how do we, well, for our, for our First Nation, we're looking at taking back our power um, because government took our power away. So we want to get up, we're looking at taking our power back because we need to do this. We need to tell government, you know, in my eyes, we're on the wrong side of the table of government. We should be at that, at that, at that standard. So I'm encouraging the First Nations people in the Yukon as well here. The only way that we're gonna get into the government to be able to make that change is to run for those seats to the, so that we can be able to be part of the solution because now government's coming to us for knowledge, so why don't we run to change this, the problem and uh, at the government level? Because we are the ones that have been here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and we looked after the land and now they're giving it back to us through land claims after they destroyed it in how many years? 150 years in Canada, you know? So we need to start looking at um, running for those seats, encouraging our young people and our younger leaders that are um, willing to do this because this is where we're gonna make the change, is that we have to run for those seats in government to take our power back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. And when you mentioned the two-headed fish and the two-tailed fish, I right away thought, well, that, that sounds like um, more pollution-based, yeah. And so uh, what I've been hearing from elders for years is the combination of pollution and climate change, but they're affecting each other, so. I, I don't know about you guys, but I got pretty depressed this summer because there was a lot of mass uh, die-offs. Akachek and I were just talking about that. Um, in Kotzebue, I was just um, uh, chatting with her uncle, Bobby, over the phone, and I thought it would be a 10-minute conversation. Hey, I'm coming to Kotzebue in November, and he went on to tell me all the species, all the animals that it died in mass droves throughout the summer, seven different species of birds are just lining the beaches, um, just dying, and seals, uh, massive amounts of seals all up washing the beach, up. washing up on shore. And my dad had mentioned to me, um, similarly, um, 
when he's traveling down the coast, he said every 10 feet is a dead bird. And it's not just, you know, seagulls and local birds. He said, I'm seeing murres, I'm seeing puffins. And these are birds that we don't see in Kotzebue. They're usually out in the ocean near, um, you know, they're, they're seabirds. And he had mentioned another bird that um, is showing up in Kotzebue that we never see anymore. And he said, um, and this is what he thinks, is that the, the fish are moving further north because it's colder water, but the birds aren't adapting quick enough to survive. And what does that mean? You know, just there's hundreds and thousands of birds dying. Yeah, and he also said that the second um, migration of fish going up the rivers the water got so hot at that point that all the fish died before they had a chance to even spawn. So massive amounts of fish were just um, going down shore dead. So major changes, especially in the last couple of years. So. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead, question. please. Along the same lines, uh, thanks a lot for the awesome images. It's been watching climatology maps, you know, over the last decade at least, and just seeing just nonstop above average temperatures in western Alaska, especially, as it seems like it's really at the extreme end of global climate change right now, is where it's one of the most impacted areas. Um, so it's really good to get some context and actually see what it really looks like as opposed to just dots on a map of warmer warmer temperatures and warmer ocean and all that. But um, just wondering along the same conversation that we're having now, have you seen uh, many new species migrate into the area that you haven't, haven't been observed in that area before? Oh, well, going back to what my dad said, I mean, I, I Honestly, I wrote it down. I don't remember the species that he mentioned um, of bird that are new to our area that we never saw before. Um, he did also mention that, um, you know, every, every family had their own favorite berry picking spot, right? And we always went back to that spot. Um, no matter if we return every year, there's just less and less berries in our area. And then further north, they're actually getting berries that they never got before. It, you know, so that's new. Um, and did you, you had mentioned different species of fish too? Um, maybe different species of fish, but I have also had uh, local people have told me that there's more um, moose in the area that they hadn't seen before. And my, my dad said recently, I think it was in the, in the Yukon, they recently caught three sturgeon. There's, that's new, you know, that is absolutely new. And what is bringing them uh, further north? That. And another species to mention that's a combination of um, human impact and climate change, you know, things are up in the air is um, the caribou. The caribou migration, how many caribou are present in that migration from year to year. Um, and there's a huge mine north of Kotzebue, Red Dog Mine. And I believe it's the largest copper mine in the United States. And there's also other mining um, that they do. Um, but since that mine, there's been a change in the mi migratory pathway of the caribou. And caribou are probably the second most important staple food in the area. So they're very important. And because gas is so expensive, it's important that they come close to where people can access them because gas is up to $12 a gallon in some of the villages. So it's pre preventative for people to go too far. Um, so, uh, you know, there's most likely a combination of changing in, um, you know, the ecology, they eat lichens, so there's probably a change in that um, impact from the mine and, and uh, various factors. Um, so, and if you want to hear about the perspective of that, I did make a video called Counting on Caribou that you can see on YouTube also that um, is all about the indigenous perspective of the impact of caribou as well. Um, well, if there's... We got oh, one more question. Kevin, go ahead. <laughs> Great job on those, by the way. Those were really good documents. 
documentaries are. Um, so I was wondering, um, what what is any local action that they're doing to change or make any changes to the way that they're friendly to the environment up there? I mean, as I was watching these uh, this documentary as they're talking, you know, about the climate's changing, the ice is receding, everything's eroding, but yet there's still like a Conoco Phillips, you know, logo on his jacket, and you know those things. Is there anything changing locally up there that uh, about they're doing with the environment, or is it just standing by, just hoping somebody else to do it? Uh, you mean are are people changing their lifestyle yes, around definitely. climate change? Um, yeah, I've seen that. I mean, I think that people are adjusting when they go out. Mm -hmm. You know, if people are used to traveling on the sea ice until June, now mm -hmm. they can only do that till early May. Yeah, that's true. And um, unfortunately this year, so I was out there for a month in April and May, mm -hmm. and in that time frame, seven people died and fell through the ice. Wow. So, you know, people try to go out when they always have been able to, but then people start falling through. And yeah, I, it, to me at this stage, you know, people always say Anupiaq people have always adapted we're very adaptive people. We live in an extreme environment, but the change has been so fast that people don't have um, a protocol now. It's almost like you have to decide on that day what's safe mm -hmm. and to hear what's going on if there are people falling through the ice. And like I said, adapt day to day um, because what happened the last two years may be completely different next year. Thank you. So, so one of the things that I, um, so my, my father was always, um, my, my father, my Uncle Bob, and other family members and other community members um, have been involved in different um, commissions, like the um, uh, Beluga and Whaling Commission, um, and that's, you know, that's circumpolar. So in, in our area, for, for example, I mean, we used to get Beluga all the time and Sarah had mentioned or m maybe touched on you know our front street um, you know we had a huge shoreline and people would have their inisucks which is their traditional wood hanging poles and you know all, all the families had their their inisucks in, in front street they had their boats there um, we had so much erosion we had a 44 million dollar renovation up front street which you cannot have that anymore there is no shore um, but we used to get beluga, multiple beluga per family every year. And, and so when I was a kid, we got beluga, we got beluga um, until I was, uh, I think in my 20s, um, maybe late 20s, and I'm 44. Um, we don't get beluga anymore. You know, and, and part, so, so when the beluga population globally went down we my my father decided i won't hunt, hunt beluga anymore you know um we rarely see them in our area and we are concerned with beluga whale um and the numbers so we we hold back on harvesting that's for sure um sarah and i were talking earlier about um you know when they had the whole bird flu in in asia and the scare, and they thought, oh, don't eat the birds in you know, springtime. I'm sorry, but you can't tell native people not to eat their native food. We're gonna eat the birds. Oh, yeah. We're gonna eat the seal, even though we see disease. Unfortunately, um, un and I, I don't know at what point, like you're saying, I mean, we, we will and we do um, make sure that there's enough. We're not harvesting over harvesting, for example, our fish, mm -hmm. if there's not enough, if they're not spawning, I mean, what does that mean next year? We have to cut back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so so we we do keep, we do look at the migration, we do look at their numbers, mm -hmm. um, and and adjust to help preserve what hopefully we'll come back next year or the year after. Um, you know, and, and it, it really depends on the families. And 
I mean, we do have internet up north, we do have television, but not everybody has access to it and not everybody could afford it. So they may not be as informed as other people. And, you know, and, and money is a factor. Cost of, of hunting and traveling is a factor. So if you have the sea ice going out or melting and you can't get Ugruk because you can't afford to go that far, you know, that prevents that as well. So, um, yeah. Is there is there any sort of a correlation in the timeline of like let's say because I know we were talking about pollution earlier in the Red Dog Mine that was that mine probably what thirty years old maybe yeah, or something like that thirty years old when was the earliest times that you started to see disease start to develop in some of the species around there is there anything that would kind of correlate with that or is it just yeah. all very rapid in the last five years not 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 five years um, you know for the seals I was. I was in my, I believe in my 20s when I first started seeing the, the new discoloration. Like, what is this? And it, you know, sometimes it's just a little spot. Okay, you just cut that out. And then it got bigger and bigger. And now we see it all the time. Um, so, and Sarah had asked, was this, was this from Fukushima? No, it was pre-Fukushima, right? So we already saw this disease before, um, you know, certain disasters. Yeah, and it could be more um, local pollutants too. Um, I've done some interviews in Kivalina, which is downriver from the mine, and um, I heard a lot of horror stories about that. So the pollution and the water color change and increase in cancer and things like that. Thank you. So, yeah. Well, I know we've gone over, so I, we should probably conclude. But if anyone has questions directly towards us, please come find us. And thank you so much for coming to our talk yeah. today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.